All right, thank you all for joining us today for our weekly archaeology and preservation webinar series. Uh, this series is going to be running all the way to Labor Day, so I hope you can continue to join us each Wednesday at noon. Uh, we have a lot of exciting topic, topics coming up, as you can see, um, and if you want to check out the full schedule, that is available on our website. Uh, the address is right there, and I'll copy it into the chat window. Uh, my name is Eric Dubik, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, before we get started, I just have a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, if you have a question for our panelists during the presentation, please use the Q&A box rather than the chat box so your question doesn't get lost in any conversations. Uh, you'll find the Q&A box right there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, second, I will be here to help with any technical issues you may have, so please do use the chat box to send me a message if you have any technical questions, and I'll do my best to help. So today we have Dr. Chris Bowles, who is our Heritage Outreach and Preservation Planning Manager here at History Colorado. And we also have a special guest joining us from all the way across the pond, uh, Andrew Manning, who is a Regional Manager for Wessex Ar Archaeology. So I'm now going to turn it over to them. Um, yeah, no, thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to be here and really honored to uh, take part in this. Um, amazing webinar series that uh, Eric has been putting together for months now. Um, I have a fairly unique perspective on this in that, yes, I work for History Colorado, um, but I previously, in a previous life, was a local authority archaeologist in the UK. Um, I worked for Scottish Borders Council for 11 years uh, as their archaeologist. Um, doing all manners of all manner of projects um, from the, the small and mundane to the large um, wind farms. So um, what I'm going to be presenting today is just basically a brief overview of where preservation in Britain came from uh, and and kind of a, a little bit about where it is right now. But I'll leave most of that heavy lifting to Andy at the end, um, who has a uh, a different perspective in that he is uh, a manager within a commercial archaeological unit um, in the UK, um, the biggest commercial archaeological unit in the UK, I believe. <laughs> so, that is <laughs> that is good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, let me let me just begin by um, kind of going over where we're at now. The UK. Um, like many places in Europe, is uh, just chock full of archaeological and historical riches um, ranging from the, the distant um, Paleolithic uh, up through to the present. Um, and it's always been known that these things are out in the landscape. This is just a brief quote from uh, a, a Byzantine historian, Procopius. Um, talking about um, what we presume to be Hadrian's Wall um, in the in the mid sixth century A.D., um, getting his information probably from Anglo-Saxon sources, um, who are talking about you know if you go over the wall you're immediately dead. Um, that's no longer the case. It is promoted as a heritage trail, um, and I think they wouldn't get too much uh, visitation if that was the case. But uh, they, they certainly um, recognized the wall as a relic in their landscape, you know, in the sixth century, um, even though, you know, it had effectively only been abandoned for about 200 years, that history had been lost, um, or at least it hadn't been communicated to the court of Byzantium. So these things were always laying around in the landscape and through the medieval period, people were, uh, you know, they were recognizing their relics in the landscape. Um, some were even trying to do things with them. But it was really only in the 16th, 17th, 18th century when um, the Enlightenment took off that there was a, a real push to try and understand these uh, places and, and objects that were coming out of the landscape in more detail. Now, the Enlightenment was a period um, where, you know, we, we, we 
kind of tend to think of them throwing off the shackles of um, of, a, of a dark age in the medieval period where people weren't learning. But really what was happening was um, there was a push against, um, a, in, to some extent against the church doctrines, but also um, a push to relearn classics. There was a burgeoning empire taking place and people were trying to understand their place in the world with this empire, uh, this new empire, um, slowly encroaching on on much of the world um, and so they were looking for analogies places like Rome Greece were the obvious analogies for them um, and that that led to a certain degree of um, of, of nationalism of pride um, but it also opened up doors for them to go and visit places in the world that also had relics laying around in the landscape um, and so there was a combination of, of visitation of, of ancient places and trying to understand themselves in this new world that was emerging of, of, of um, enlightened doctrine and imperial doctrine. Um, it should be said that this is not reflective of the majority of people living in Britain at the time or even in Europe at the time. It was those people with disposable wealth, disposable time, people who were, say, in the East India Company, who were traveling around, um, working for uh, the company and visiting places. Um, it was a pursuit of the rich for the betterment of the rich. Um, the majority of people at this time weren't necessarily as concerned about their heritage as, um, or certainly world heritage, um, as, as, as many others were. In this period, we also had the creation of tourism. Um, and it was very much uh, a heritage-driven tourism. The grand tour of Europe and the Near East, um, even people traveling as far away as China, um, you know, was, was effectively something that was, let's go out and look at everybody's relics in the landscape and try to understand the world um in new ways and to some extent let's steal them uh now this is the famous lord elgin um who brought back the elgin marbles from athens a very to to this day a very controversial um topic he was doing preservation in his mind what he was doing was trying to preserve these marbles, which he saw as elegant pieces of art from a, a bygone age um, for the betterment of um, certainly Britain, but also for the betterment of the objects themselves. Um, he saw them in this um, Acropolis in Athens, uh, you know, falling to bits, um, not being cared for, not being loved. Um, so he brought them back to Britain. Um, we would call that cultural appropriation today. Um, he very much felt that it was in the best interest of these objects. Um, and to this day, to some extent, the British Museum is still holding to that, um, that viewpoint and not sending them back because they don't feel that Athens has the ability to look after them properly. Um, I don't want to get too much into that, but, you know, we, we, still hold to these ideals to some extent that have been uh, perpetuated from the distant 18th century when these marbles were first taken, um, what, rightly or wrongly, whether we should or not. We, we still, th those, those ideas are still very much out there. So we had these largely aristocratic, um, you know, in some cases, the, uh, the ruling class of Britain, um, going away and, and seeing things in the, in the world and bringing things home and um, curating objects, um, curating sites in some cases, and particularly within the empire. What this did was generate a sense of, of historical necessity within the homeland. Um, of understanding the, the, the roots of um, Britain's own history, uh, which had largely been ignored up until this point. And uh, we're talking about the late 18th century here. Um, 
a lot of the, the learned societies, and I'll, I'll get into those here in a moment, that had been created up until that point, had been concerned with Rome and Greece, um, the classics, um, and to some extent Egypt. Egypt was always a big, a big thing to know about. Um, but we had these relics in Britain's landscape that also were um, falling to bits. So it was people, I would say, more middle class um, who couldn't necessarily go away to Europe on the Grand Tour, who couldn't necessarily go away and, and bring things home and have the ex expertise to, um, to understand what the, the, these classical sites were telling them, um, who started looking at these at, at, at home. People like Sir Walter Scott, <clears throat> who was born on a farm just below this tower, um, Smalem Tower in the Scottish borders, um, who was uh, Sir Walter Scott, obviously a famous author, but um, he was also an antiquarian and he was, um, uh, along with several others, responsible for understanding Scotland's history better and Scotland's archaeology better. Um, he was a proponent of, of let's apply these, these great high disciplines to, to Scotland's history and, and archaeology. And in England and Wales, there were similar figures who were trying to, to do this work. And many of them were members of these learned societies. So here we have the, the Society of Antiquaries of London. We have the Society of Antiquaries in Scotland, both founded in the 18th century. The Society of Antiquaries of London founded in the 1750s and in Scotland it was the 1780s. Um, most of the people again had disposable wealth and income and, and, and uh, but they were, they were kind of less of the arist aristocratic um, establishment that were, that were members of these learned societies. And they were genuinely trying to understand better what was all around them. Um, they were engaging in, um, in hypotheticals and scientific theory, uh, very much in line with the, the Scottish Enlight or the, sorry, the, the Enlightenment generally, um, you know, trying to apply new scientific disciplines to, or scientific thoughts to the past, um, creating journals and, and, um, and, and bringing those, um, those ideas into publication for the first time. And that was a, that was a key uh, moment in the, in the history of archaeology and preservation in Britain. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm purposely putting archaeology and uh, building preservation together because in the UK, it has always been They've, they've always been kind of walking side by side. Um, they have, um, the buildings that are out there in the, in the world, in the UK, um, some of which are hundreds of years old, an archeologist would see those as archeology, span um, a conservationist would see those as something to conserve, um, but they're the same thing. And, and so there's, there's always been a kind of a side by side correlation between the two. Um, so these, these, these grand national learned societies, they actually generated a, um, a new um, kind of field across the United Kingdom where local people started doing similar things. And societies were growing up all over uh, Britain in the 19th century, particularly from about the 1820s, 1830s onwards, where we had uh, societies in towns, in cities, in counties, um, all trying to understand their local um, environments. At the same time, there was there was mapping exercises that were going on across um, across the United Kingdom that were starting to chart the antiquities of the of the country. Um, I put this up. This is um, General um, William Roy's survey of Scotland. Um, from about the 1750s, um, he was a um, he was tasked by um, the British government to do a very detailed map of Scotland in order to better understand where the Jacobites were, so that they can't they wouldn't get attacked again um, after Bonnie Prince Charlie's rebellion. Um, so he did this very detailed map of, of Britain, and in it he, he includes some details of antiquities, particularly churches. 
um, places where you might expect uh, a Jacobite with a gun to hide, <laughs> I think more or less. Um, so he, you know, and this was effectively the first ordnance survey. It was also a survey to see where the ordnance of the military could travel um, in response to re local rebellions or um, cattle raiding or, or what have you in Scotland. Uh, we also had the, um, the agricultural revolution taking off in this time in the late, well, between the, the, the mid 18th century and the, and the early 19th century. Um, again, part of the enlightenment, people who had lots of land were trying to better understand how to use their land um, through enlightened, um, uh, enlightened um, knowledge. Um, things like putting lime in the fields to increase productivity. Um, they were trying to get a better sense of what lands they could use, so they were creating estate maps. And the estate maps um, were, were done by cartographers um, all over the, the United Kingdom, and almost all of them um, did start putting in antiquities into their um, into their estate maps so that the, the, the landowner could know, um, you know, where they might have an obstruction. For instance, this in the center here, um, you see Old City of Refuge or Druidic Temple. Um, in actual fact, that's a henge. Um, and we know, it's, we know it's a henge from aerial photography. It's long since been taken down by the landowner there. Um, we, you know, there's, no, there's nothing left of that. Um, but, you know, we, we have this cartographer in the 1780s making a map of it for us. Uh, we also had then in the, starting in the 17, or the 1840s, um, the, the government, and I apologize for the quality of this, it looked better when I put it in, uh, we had the, uh, the government um, trying to do another mapping exercise for the whole country. Um, and again, calling it the Ordnance Survey. So very much a, a, a military focus um, in terms of what they were looking to achieve. Um, but it's the first accurate map of Britain, um, of the entire country. Um, it was it involved um, hundreds of people going out with uh, little more than chains in some instances and, and measuring the entire length and breadth of the country. Um, they were also interviewing local people. And one of the things that they asked, um, and we have, we have their books still surviving in some cases, um, where they've been writing down notes from um, people that they asked locally. One of the things they asked was, what antiquities do you have on your, on your land? And um, what is the name, names of them? What, you know, um, what do you know about them? And um, they were also reading, reading books as well to try and understand these things better. So they were actually, you know, in, in, in the large parts of the United Kingdom, they were the first ones to mark down where a lot of our sites and monuments are. Um, and in this instance here, they've, they've um, recorded a camp because they believed it to be a Roman camp. Um, erroneously, it's an Iron Age uh, fort, um, but they've, they've accurately or as accurately as possible have measured the, the, the circuit of the ramparts around that site. So we have a, a, a sort of combination of things taking place. Um, we have um, mapping, we have enlightenment um, knowledge, we have learned societies and local societies trying to understand their environment better. The next step um, obviously was to try and dig them up and figure out what they were. Um, and this happened across the UK. It became a, a trend in the later 19th century for local societies to try and excavate sites in their districts. Um, it also involved um, preservation efforts of, uh, of local um, buildings, um, and particularly those that related to key prominent figures um, or to um, um, bits of history that they found to be important. So there were preservation efforts that 
um, were attempts to do almost full restoration of places um, and usually very badly. Uh, but but they did they did try to do some of that work. Um, here we have a, a chap uh, standing at the bottom of a ditch that um, he's probably done most of the excavation on, um, standing below um, a profile that I think we would consider to be fairly dangerous uh, by today's standards. Um, and uh, this was at um, the site of Trimontium. Um, in, in Scotland, a Roman fort. All of this was happening uh, at the, the kind of um, amateur volunteer level, um, but the government, um, and largely because it was, the government was made up of, and, and parliament was made up of the aristocratic classes who were doing a lot of this work, um, started trying to protect these monuments. And so, they came up with the Ancient Monuments Protections Act of 1882. And that was followed on by several um, uh, attempts to, to, to juggle with the issues that were coming out of it. Um, we also had the National Trust Act of 1907, and that was the government um, effectively taking um, bequests from landowners of land, of buildings, um, they did a lot of preservation work on those buildings as the National Trust, after the National Trust Act. Um, and then we had the, the, the Royal Warrants um, establishing the Royal Commissions. The Royal Commissions are a, a very interesting case because they were basically the first professional attempt to understand our, um, our heritage. Most of them, it should be said, um, most of the first commissioners were amateurs. They were coming from these learned societies, but they were uh, trying to apply um, scientific methodologies to understand these sites and monuments better and buildings. Um, so from about 1908, um, when one of the first reports came out for the county of Berwick um, in Scotland, um, they were inventorying every single monument that they could find. Well, to say that, they were inventorying the sexy ones that they could find. They were, they were less concerned about old farms, uh, more concerned about nice hill forts and castles. Uh, but they were, they were doing a really great job in, um, in, for the first time, trying to get to grips with the measurements of these sites, what they were, their histories, and putting them in print um, for everybody. And the purpose of these inventories was so that they, these sites could be protected. Um, it, was, it was all a preservation effort. It was a data, data gathering exercise. Now, some of the people who started um, working in archeology span and, and preservation, um, they were very much influenced by the, the kind of amateur um, uh, and local archaeological um, endeavors, but they were also um, trying to become a bit more scientific. And the military played a big role, uh, military training played a big role in the professionalization of, of certainly of archaeology. Um, so you had people like General Pitt Rivers, um, who was the, for, the first uh, inspector of ancient monuments in England. Um, he was heavily influenced by his role in the military um, to the point uh, where he applied military discipline and, 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 and um, um, tactics of, of um, measurement um, of, of battlefields and, and that sort of thing um, to archaeology. Um, and he created effectively the first scientific uh, archaeological uh, approaches. Um, you had the famous Lawrence of Arabia, um, who was, um, he, he did, um, I think, classics um, at university uh, and was aiming to become an archaeologist, but then joined the military and, and uh, was a surveyor in, um, in, the, in the Near East uh, and Arabia, and then, of course, got sidetracked by becoming a rebel. Um, you know, it sometimes happens. 
So he was um, very much, though, a, a, a military person involved in archaeology. Um, two people who were extremely influential in, in British archaeology, O.G.S. Crawford, who in World War I was a, um, a pilot doing photography, um, brought back his expertise um, into the archaeological realm after the war by saying, actually, we need to start using this aerial photography to start understanding our, um, our archaeology better. Um, and we can actually look at a lot more archaeological sites through aerial photography than we ever could on the ground. Um, and then Mortimer Wheeler, who um, became a household name in Britain, mostly through, um, through television and, and uh, he, was a, he was a very um, charismatic man. Um, he was a, um, a, he was in, in World War I again, um, and he was very heavily influenced by Pitt Rivers, um, but also his own experiences of, um, you know, how to, um, how to conduct and project manage um, groups of people and, and how to conduct survey um, in a very military kind of way. And then you had people who were not military professionals, but who were still very influential. Um, Veer Gordon Child, an Australian archaeologist who worked in, in the UK for most of his career, um, was very anti-military. Um, he was an objector and later become, became the first Marxist archaeologist. Um, uh, but he was still very influential. And I would say that his kind of viewpoint is now the predominant in British archaeology <laughs> as opposed to that military perspective. Um, aerial survey really transformed um, British archaeology um, to the point where now it is almost ubiquitous. It, it's, it's something that's done constantly um, through different ways now. I mean, we do LIDAR and, and other forms of remote sensing, but aerial photography is where it all began. Um, and the Ordnance Survey under OGS Crawford was, was looking for archaeological sites everywhere. The Royal Air Force um, in the 1940s was taking pictures of every square inch of the country. Um, well, the world, but also Britain. And, um, and their photographs were uh, very, um, very useful to archaeologists and they were able to find um, a large number of, of new sites that way. Um, one of the, the, the main um, uh, photographers working for the RAF at the time was, was a person called J.K. St. Joseph, and he became an archaeologist, or he was already an archaeologist, but it was through St. Joseph's, um, uh, to some extent, um, pioneering um, uses of, of new photographic techniques in aerial photography that really led to the, um, to the, the incredible wealth of information that we have. Uh, many, many of his photos are still used um, to this day for looking at, at uh, the archaeology of the country. Um, and, you know, his techniques are still being used to this day. So out of, out of all of this, you know, we had this, this uh, inventory process being done. Uh, we had a, a um, uh, we had efforts to preserve archaeology and, and, and built heritage. Um, we had um, aerial photography. We had excavations taking place, um, mostly from universities. Um, you know, again, still trying to understand the local um, archaeological riches. Um, there was still this need to, um, to preserve. And in particular, from about from the post-war period, from about the late 1940s up through the 1960s and 70s, there was a huge amount of development taking place across the UK. And this, you know, new motorways, new estates, new, um, um, new cities in some cases. Um, and this led to a, a fear that most of this heritage was being, uh, most, a lot of heritage was being lost. 
Um, so Parliament started taking it on themselves again to try and preserve this heritage. Um, there was the Historic Buildings and Ancient Monuments Act of 1953. Um, more importantly, the Ancient Monuments Act of 1979, which is still um, kind of our, our standing guidance for how to preserve archaeological sites through scheduling and, 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 and built heritage sites as well. Um, scheduling is, is effectively the same thing as putting something on the National Register uh, here. Um, scheduling a site um, brought with it a protection that couldn't be afforded through, um, through any other means. Um, listing is the other. Um, so you, you, would, you would schedule, the idea is anyway, you would schedule a ruined building, but you would list a building that was still being used. That's the principle. It doesn't always work that way, but that's the principle. So the, the, the listing of, um, of important buildings was also taking place um, increasingly um, through the Ancient Monuments Act, but it was um, reinvigorated in the 1990s under the Town and Country Planning Act um, when it became part of planning. So planners around the country um, up until the 1990s, um, you know, didn't necessarily have to take account of heritage. They did take account of heritage, but they didn't have to take account of heritage. After 1990, they did. Um, and that led to a complete reorganization of archaeology um, and, and built heritage um, uh, and working with listed buildings. Um, so that now there was a commercial, commercial drive to try and um, mitigate effects on archaeology and on listed buildings through planning. Um, I'll let Andy go into this in more depth, but the commercial um, landscape effectively didn't exist before 1990. After 1990, um, a large number of new companies grew up to service this industry of mitigation. And to this point, in 2020, um, it is now the majority of, um, the majority of work being done in archeology span is done through this process. Um, and the academic institutions um, are largely now out of the picture. They, they simply don't have the money or the resources to undertake many large uh, or many excavations in the way that um, uh, the commercial industry does. Um, now it's not targeted, that is an issue. Um, it's not necessarily targeted at any given sites. Um, it is um, ad hoc and piecemeal and, and you never know what you're gonna find. Um, but we also now know um, so much more than we ever would have under the previous regimes, um, pre-1990. And in this, um, in this world um, of, of commercial archeology, span the planning authorities also realized that they needed to have in-house expertise. Um, and this led to the, the creation of local authority curators and these are people who are curating effectively the local database for archeological and, and built sites. Uh, and that's where I came in um, 12 years ago, um, doing, doing that job. And there was uh, um, increasingly this, this need to um, also do archeology span at the local authority level. So in England, unlike Scotland and Wales, um, in England, a lot of these local authorities also had their own excavation units who would go out and, and do the work, do the mitigation work. Um, I think increasingly that's now seen as being um, something that a local authority couldn't fund. So there's, there's very few of these things left. Uh, most, of, most of the units now are commercial. Um, but the local authority archaeologists are still charged with maintaining their databases, their sites and monuments records, um, or some people call it their historic environment records. Um, and they're also still charged with servicing the planning industry. So the majority of the work at that level is 
um, servicing planning and looking at planning applications, make sure people aren't digging up things that they shouldn't be. Um, I, should, I should say that the protections afforded through the planning legislation means that every planning application that comes through, apart from those that might be permitted in some way, um, are subject to archeological um, and, and uh, historic building um, review. So that, you know, the, the ground take of, of all of the planning applications that come through in a year is tremendous. So there's archeologists looking over um, huge areas of land, uh, across the UK every year um, and ensuring that the heritage is, is either protected or um, preserved through recording. There's also the national agencies um, and I'll just briefly say their role is increasingly more one of guidance. They do less in terms of preservation. Um, the nationals are still in charge of scheduling and listing sites. Um, but there, their kind of regulatory role ends. You have Historic England and English Heritage, which only recently separated into two organizations. Um, you have Historic Environment Scotland. You have CADU, which is the Welsh agency. And then you have the National Trusts, which are effectively charities now. Um, but they still look after a good chunk of uh, the UK's property. Um, and, and do a lot of preservation work within those properties. I'll briefly say a bit about metal detecting because recently, and recently I'd say within the last 25 years or so, um, this has become a major, major uh, thing in the UK. Um, I'm sure m many of you will have heard of the, um, the Anglo-Saxon hoard that was found in Staffordshire uh, about, well, what was that, about 10 years ago now? Um, we also had a Viking horde, um, which is pictured here, that was found in Dumfrieshire in Scotland um, about five or six years ago. Um, and that's the guy who found it there. Amateur metal detectorists who are going out and just detecting everything uh, that they can get their hands on. Um, and they're pulling up huge amounts of material out of the ground. Um, this hoard here, the Viking hoard, was found um, on, in a field opposite a church and the, and the hoard itself was probably some kind of a deposit as a sacrifice or a, a votive in, within the church context. Um, it was excavated by, an by a local authority archaeologist, I should say, who had to take vacation because his local authority wouldn't allow him to do it. Um, but it was professionally excavated once it was reported into the local authority. Um, so that's good, but many aren't. And then you also have um, Ill illegal antiquities, um, um, people who are servicing illegal antiquities um, dealers, um, who we call nighthawks, and they are going out in the middle of the night, thus their name, um, and effectively looting sites and, and taking huge amounts of material out of, of known archaeological sites, some of which are scheduled and supposedly protected. Um, it's illegal to do so, but they do it anyway. They don't care. Um, by and large, most metal detectorists in the UK are nice people. They're good people. They're interested, and they, they actually um, care about what they find. Um, most of them are just looking for, for silver co medieval silver coins. They're not even looking for hoards or anything like that. Um, most of them find tractor parts, um, and, you know, that's a source of... of anger for them. Um, but uh, it is a big issue and it, it's something that, that um, I think has become so major um, that the UK are struggling to tackle this um, kind of proliferation of amateur metal detectorists. And to bring it full circle, um, we have um, volunteerism on the rise again. Um, so archaeology and, and historic preservation in the UK started out as a very much um, pursuit of the rich, um, but they were amateurs. Um, and, you know, and the increasing professionalization over the 20th century pushed a lot of that kind of amateurism out of the, out of the water um, and, um, and people kind of lost interest. But over the last 
30 years or so, 40 years or so, historical societies, archaeological societies, who have been going since the 19th century in, in many instances, have started doing archaeology again or doing historic preservation again. Um, there is an issue in terms of their age profile, and you see the picture in the bottom was from a, a conference that I used to run. Um, most of them are probably in their 70s, um, and, and very few of them will, will be going out and doing archaeology. Um, but there's also drives to bring in other groups. Um, I think Andy will talk about some of those later. Um, but also, you know, there's, there's um, you know, every excavation now just about has some kind of a public face um, and a promotional effort um, to, to try and bring in more people and attract more people into archaeology. Um, less so with preservation efforts with buildings, but it does happen. I'll go through very briefly, very briefly with some case studies, um, just to kind of illustrate some of the things that we deal with. Um, all of these come from my area because I know it the best in the Scottish borders. Um, the first area was, um, is Jedburgh, which is a small royal borough right on the border with England, um, where we had a building that was unsafe. It was falling to bits. The owner had effectively abandoned it, uh, and it was having to come down in the middle of the high street of this royal borough. The royal borough is, um, we think, dates from about the 12th century, but there had been people living there from at least the 6th century. Um, so we didn't know what we were going to find in there. But it was unsafe, it had to come down, we had to come up very quickly with an archaeological response to this building um, as it was being demolished. Um, the back wall of the building was just chock full of interesting things. There's a, um, a reused um, uh, doorway here with carved stone. There was um, obviously carved stones from other buildings um, elsewhere within the walls. So it promised to be kind of an archaeological um, uh, challenge to try and record all of this as it was coming down. We had it first of all laser scanned um, just to get a baseline for, for, the, for its size. We couldn't actually go in to laser scan it at that point. But once we could get in, as the building was being torn down, and excavating effectively, the, the peeling back the layers of this building, um, a whole host of interesting things were found. This oak floor um, emerged and we had it uh, dendrochronologically dated um, to the winter of 1667. So we had a, a good understanding of when that floor was built at least, um, or at least when the timbers were, were taken down. Um, but in the back of the, the building, um, we had this floor cut across an earlier um, door and a, a turret stairway, um, which are probably 16th century in date. Um, the front of the building, when we looked at it, promised us something of probably Georgian date or Victorian date. So we had no inkling whatsoever that we would be starting to push back into the 16th or 17th century. Um, when we did, we all of a sudden got a better understanding of that high street um, in, within a royal borough. Um, and now all indications are that every single building in that street has this similar history. A second case study um, is Trustees Hill, which is a site that I, I, I co-directed and, and, and published um, in Dumfries and Galloway, um, which is on the other side of the coast um, from where I used to work or the, the country. Um, it was here at Gatehouse of Fleet on the Solway coast. There's a nice map showing you our, our hill fort. Um, that's a picture of the hill fort. Doesn't look like much from there. It's a very small site. Um, but at its entrance um, was a carved stone with um, what looks to be Pictish carvings. Um, I won't go into the whole details of the pics. If anybody wants to ask me questions about that, they, they, they can. Um, but this, um, this carving here is about 500 miles away from the nearest Pictish carving. So we were wondering, what's it doing there at the entrance to a, a, a hill fort? Um, we had this one laser scanned as well um, and analyzed by somebody who knows Pictish carvings better than I do. 
and they were able to tell us that it was indeed genuine, uh, as well as you know, graffitied out the wazoo. Um, and in our excavations, we used local volunteers. Um, we had in all about a hundred volunteers show up for the two weeks that we were there. Um, we couldn't all give them all a trowel, um, but we were able to um, allow them to do sieving and to, uh, to help us do survey of the hill. Um, many of them stayed for the entire two weeks. Um, and it was, just a, it was just a brilliant effort. And, and I'm happy to say now that the, um, um, the town, Gatehouse of Fleet, have taken this site on as kind of a local, a local landmark um, where they didn't really know it existed before. The, the carvings of the, of the Pictish stone is now um, kind of everywhere in that town. You'll see it everywhere. There's children who have written poetry about this place. Um, ex exhibits have been going on since 2012 when we, when we excavated. And this just turned into a local kind of um, uh, source of pride, but also tourism. And they are actively promoting this site now. And my third case study, um, <laughs> is um, a valley in um, between the counties of East Lothian and the Scottish borders. Um, right in there, um, this valley runs um, effectively across these hills called the Lammermuirs. Um, and beginning in about 2011, 2012, um, we ended up with literally dozens of wind farm applications in those hills. Um, and in trying to think about how that was impacting the local heritage, um, I, I, I got the feeling that, um, and I was putting it in planning at, um, responses, that the setting of a lot of sites um, was being impacted. Uh, so on that basis, I started accumulating bribes, I mean, <clears throat> developer contributions um, from local developers who were giving, um, you know, basically money um, on the basis that they were impacting these sites and they knew that they were impacting these sites. And I started um, pooling this money together. I managed to get um, European funding to do um, a large scale landscape archeology span project where, where we bought in high resolution LIDAR. This is a site called Eden's Hall Brock. Um, and in that high resolution LIDAR, we put it available um, through the internet publicly um, and asked for a citizen science approach to the LIDAR. So we ended up with uh, hundreds of people telling us where sites were um, in the LIDAR. Some of, some of them were, you know, complete rubbish, but some of them were genuinely new sites that we didn't know existed before. And that pooling of resources really helped us understand that, that landscape better. Um, and it's still, it's still on the go. Um, and what we decided would be best for this landscape in order to mitigate those impacts from the wind farms um, would be to actually um, explore the entirety of the heritage. So not just the archeology, span not just the built heritage, um, but also here you see stories and ballads, the creative arts, um, you know, the, the history, um, the inspiration of this um, valley on creativity um, and from, you know, the 18th century when our first ballads are being written up to the present where people are, are, are painting this beautiful river um, through the countryside. Um, and it's been fantastic. Even in, despite COVID, um, they had, a, they had a, um, uh, an online exploration um, of the Widder about two months ago. Um, and they had, I, I believe it's something like five or 6,000 people take part, um, which never would have happened without COVID um, and, and using Zoom. So I will leave it there and I will happily answer any questions at the end. Um, but now over to England. Professionalism. But first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I've got a number of very good friends at uh, Historic Colorado I went to college with and have previous uh, and have recently met. So it's a great pleasure uh, to look through some of your previous talks and a fantastic re uh, resource. Um, 
very quick introduction of uh, who I uh, who I am. Chris has given a, a background to the tutorial side. I'm very much a, a field archaeologist, but I've really benefited a great deal from uh, Chris was mentioning the bringing in a planning policy in the 1990s when the need to do archaeology was inbuilt into the planning system it became a firm requirement and was uniformly applied across the country uh, by guidelines which were nationally developed by the government um, which suddenly meant that archaeology um, suddenly became uh, a not only a career a firm career but for much larger numbers of people than before and in fact um, I started working as a field archaeologist just about after the introduction of this system. So it's actually given me a career. And to date now, you've probably got something in the region of about 7,000 full-time archaeologists actually working um, admittedly for commercial firms and for uh, universities, but majority of them in the commercial sector, which still forms even to now because of our strong planning system requiring data to inform planning decisions um, is an enormous amount of archaeology is being done. Now I've worked but worked around most of uh, most of England. I've also worked in Wales as well and the Welsh units kicked off in 1974 again as an early stage when they were all attached to local government and funded by local government essentially to be able to map and to keep a record of what was known archaeologically that was the big importance of that uh, change coming in in the 1970s but of course from the 1990s it was about using that information to help inform the planning system formally now first of all Wessex Archaeology, the company I work for, is, is one of the biggest commercial firms in Britain, I would argue the largest. There are a number of others that you might have heard or come across if you see any of the archaeological news from Britain. Cotswold Archaeology I used to work for, um, MOLA, the Museum of London Archaeological Unit, um, the Oxford, uh, Oxford Archaeology, now, uh, all of them originally started off as government funded organizations doing a bit of digging um, and managing archaeology but have subsequently have developed and Wessex effectively not only do we do field work we are ultimately an educational charity like many of the larger units because we not only do archaeology we also are functioned to try and get it out to the community about why it's important and its role, its role in society. It is interesting that uh, the different units and the nature of archaeology is constantly changing. When I started, the vast majority of people that uh, I knew working in commercial archaeology were largely field archaeologists or people who are doing post excavation with fines, for instance, and report writing. But in the last 10 years, even looking just at our, um, our company, our group, is now we employ divers, we employ pilots, uh, surveyors, all to do in-house because the requirements and what is needed to be done for checking out and dealing with archaeology is increasingly um, becoming important and what is expected and what is expected and a very important change in that throughout our history as I said we've been an educational charity we've always reached out to local societies giving talks but in the last 10 years changes to the um, planning policy guidance the national framework increasingly has emphasized that the important thing with planning applications is that not only should you do the archaeology, does the archaeology need to be assessed and mitigated, but the results ought to be communicated to give the local community a sense and feeling 
of belonging to it. It belongs to them. And increasingly now, uh, outreach and community outreach to all levels, not just to children, but to adults, to families, to everybody, is an increasingly important part of that. Now, later on in the presentation, I'm going to give a few examples of this, and you will see some of the some of the reasons why this has become absolutely vital. But as I said, if you look at the commercial companies, whether it's Wessex or Oxford or a number of others, you will see a massive number of jobs that people do, the skills they have, because this is what's required to do the heritage, to record it. And not just the traditional digging, but Chris has already mentioned building archaeology as well, which is all under the same title of heritage. We deal with everything and our planning system also assumes that everything can be done. Now Chris has given some indication of how the, um, the system is organized. Effectively from my point of view the vast majority of our work is via planning applications. Any planning application that goes in is assessed at the local planning authority. It could be a county or a, uh, a statutory uh, authority uh, for a large city where they need information or request information. Is there an impact on heritage to inform any decisions they make to grant planning or not? So in fact, 95% of what I do is to go through with clients with planning applications. What do they need to do? What information is needed and how their planning conditions are going to be satisfied? Um, it sounds it sounds very dull, but um, it is an inc it's incredibly exciting because every case is different. Now, there are a few projects that we do which go a little bit beyond that. Um, and I don't want to go into huge depth, but occasionally there are some areas which obviously if there are scheduled monuments or listed buildings that we not only deal with the local authority archaeologists, but we also have to deal with the national statutory advisors, uh, whether it's Historic England or um, English Heritage, um, because they're the ones who manage and protect listed buildings. So we occasionally work with them and also other specialist groups that are set up. Um, the World Heritage Sites is a good example and I'll say a little bit more about them later on, but these are areas of extremely significant archaeology where the county would normally be the ones in charge of it, but because of its significance it goes beyond that. It's actually uh, part, it's actually managed by national groups. One of the things that happens, just to try and set this in the scene, is that we have to guide our clients through what is required. Now, the requirements and guidelines of what is required are put out there by the national groups, by the English Heritage, and these are effectively the standards and works that are required. And curators, the local planning authority curators are fairly uniform across the country. They're able to take these guidelines and to sort out their own requirements. Now, interestingly enough, something I've put this example in, um, which is very recently, only a year or so ago, piling um, in some of our urban towns was becoming quite uh, an issue. And historic England upgraded their advice because of new piling methods. And this is partly what we do, is not only do the digging, we actually help with the design of buildings to try and reduce the impact. Now on the right hand side, you can see the plan of a, a building. This is actually in Winchester. I didn't want to put the name of the building down, but it's a new build right in the center of Winchester, a historic town. It's a Roman town, which then is an Anglo-Saxon town. And believe me, 
you don't have to go very deep to have extremely significant archaeological deposits. Um, the road system is the, almost identical to what it was in Roman times. So the, even the streets and roads uh, have been around for over 2000 years. But with this particular project, an awful lot of time had to be spent helping with the consultation with the client and dealing with the local authority archaeologist to ensure that the piling foundation, the actual impact wasn't huge except for piles. But the new piling regulations meant there had to be a lot of redesigning to try and reduce the impact on this building. And right in the middle where you've got the A and the little circle, in fact, is a medieval water course running through, which used to supply fresh water to the nearby streets and community. And that effectively was preserved and protected from any impact at all. The piling was designed to preserve as much archaeology as possible and that's part of the job I do but we are guided by the national groups who give us the guidelines and what they are requiring and they tell the local authority archaeologists and we're there to help guide people through. Now not only field archaeology but of course Chris actually gave a couple of very good examples already of buildings and on the uh, left hand side, the, the black and white building, again, these are not listed buildings. These are just normal buildings which have local heritage, have been recognized by local groups as being important to them and which are inbuilt into the planning system that action is taken to try and preserve or mitigate them as best as possible. The building on the left hand side is an old family workshop in Sheffield which used to make Sheffield steel and knives. It's a knife making factory run by a small family over a very long period. The whole city was packed with buildings like this. If you went back 100, 200 years ago this was a very very common feature but of course Sheffield has changed. It is now that it was the only example left and unfortunately, the building was falling down. It was technically unsafe. So as part of the planning application to replace it, it was important, A, to record the building. It was laser scanned and digitally recorded. But the decision was taken to rebuild it. And it was using those digital records taken down and rebuilt elsewhere. And that was done part of the planning application. The requirement and the need and the method was inbuilt into the planning system. Now Chris has already mentioned um, laser scanning for instance. The church at the top right hand side is St Andrew's um, Church in Hampshire and again technology is wonderful, it's revolutionized it is first of all now we can produce digitized models and records of churches prior to any changes or uses and not only that but of course you can strip them down, you can phase them, you can rebuild them. And as we'll see later on there is a, a new mass market starting to appear where these 3D models can actually be printed and actually made for people. You can get very realistic models. Another example of you know just a, a standard planning application that, that often comes in that has a little bit of historical twist in it. On the bottom right is, the, is a pub in Salisbury. I'm, I'm based in Salisbury so this is, uh, this is one of our pubs. Uh, this is the Bishop's Mill. Now it, uh, if you walk around Salisbury, Salisbury is a, uh, a medieval city so uh, it doesn't look too much out of place. But in actual fact it has a very interesting history. The Bishop's Mill itself is only 18th century. It was a corn mill and it's built over one of the races um, that runs through Salisbury. So that is the original mill part of it, the original race, and the, the wheel is still there. But historically, it, it, it was the first power station in Salisbury used to generate 
power and in fact the hospital the first hospital in Salisbury was just the other side of the road and it was powered directly by the power station but buildings change but the interesting thing is as part of this planning application what was expected was first of all to record the interior of the building although much of it had been gutted and taken away the building had been um uh, had been left for quite a number of years and this was renovation into uh, a new pub but it has many features which still remain and it is important as part of their planning condition was to record and to retain these buildings the, these features of the building as much as possible we help to guide them with the recording and the consultation but it is a value to the local authority that these buildings are preserved as best as possible and this is a good example that now when you go to the pub uh, it's hope it's only just reopened but when you go in there you can actually sit in what is a, a well-preserved historical building and it still remains there i haven't got any images of it but if you go to the cinema in uh, salisbury you're actually inside a medieval house and in fact the ticket booth and entrance is actually through the main hall you can actually see the medieval features of the building which are still built and preserved and protected by a listing for the future now i'm going to talk about a couple of examples and things most of these are going to be in in wiltshire our home place there are a number of issues that that does come up why the planning system is so important now, uh, forgive me uh, for uh, just in case anyone does is not too hot on what Wiltshire uh, is. I've given a quick little sort of uh, indication of where Wiltshire actually is. We're based uh, not too far away from the uh, the southwest coast, um, sandwiched between Hampshire and Somerset and Dorset and uh, to the north we've got Berkshire as, as well. The county itself is only about 1400 square miles as you can see with a population of 720,000 so it's not absolutely massive. We only really have two major cities, Swindon in the north which is a big industrial city and Salisbury which only has 50,000 people which is historically um, one of the uh, the administrative centres of, of Wiltshire um, and we're down in the south but we may be a small county and we may be a great deal of rural nature a lot of farmland um, lots of little villages but not very built up only two only two major cities but one of the great features of Wiltshire is the absolute significant density of archaeology because we've tended to be fairly rural in this area an awful lot of archaeology has survived and another factor which has helped the survival in Wiltshire bizarrely but true is that for over a hundred years almost a tenth of Wiltshire one ninth to be precise has actually been owned and controlled by the Ministry of Defence and is used as training areas which means that there's been very little development in the last hundred years and so you have huge swathes of archaeology which is preserved protected from the, the guys firing the guns and the rockets and everything but a huge resource which is protected and the MOD have their own archaeologists and you you will hear a little bit more about that later on but one of the big effects for Wiltshire, which affects our planning system, is that while you have a number of areas, the World Heritage Sites, which are internationally protected, uh, they're certainly you know, scheduled, you can barely dig, put a spade in the ground in any of those areas. Each of them is about 10, uh, 10 miles square. And one is around Avebury Henge, and one is around the Stonehenge area. You can see the, the um, Stonehenge area to the south but bear in mind that although the protection within those areas is extremely stringent as soon as you leave the boundaries of that area you're into the normal planning system 
with Wiltshire Council and its staff of three archaeologists guiding every planning application. And there are hundreds every year just for Wiltshire. Three planning archaeologists and one historic uh, environment uh, record keeper. So a very small staff, very hard work. And they have to deal with all the pressures that's going on because Wiltshire is growing. The population needs houses, needs jobs, new work happening. We know very much at the moment, um, getting things moving again is very, is important and the big effects that this is going to have. Wiltshire is no different. If you look at the bottom right hand side, you can see the World Heritage Site. You can see a town there, that is Amesbury and Durrington, two towns. They are doubling in size every five years. And believe me, I'm going to show you in a moment some slides. The archaeology within the World Heritage Site quite merrily carries on. There is density of archaeological features is just the same. It's just a historical nature that the World Heritage Site boundaries have been set in law before. Doesn't mean the archaeology ends at those boundaries. And that is one of the challenges that we have in commercial archaeology is dealing with clients and with local authorities so that we can still protect, maintain, record and mitigate the archaeology throughout the country but particularly in this area is a good example of the pressure that it's under and the planning system in Britain is fantastic. I have to say that uh, you know it for a very small number of people the protection it tries to give at local and regional level is incredible. Now, it was suggested to me, uh, I'm about to show you some other images of uh, some extreme archaeology, but um, somebody suggested that I might want to give some terms. So forgive me if these are very familiar to you. But um, we are in uh, an area where what is normally rare elsewhere in Britain is actually as, I was about to say, as common as muck here, but um, they are quite common. Causeways enclosures. Wiltshire is famous. We have medieval Roman archaeology, Anglo-Saxon archaeology like anybody, but a huge density and very significant density of prehistoric archaeology and especially well known for Neolithic archaeology. And most of the huge numbers of monuments in Wiltshire are often Neolithic in nature. The causeways enclosures the earliest examples we've got of Neolithic enclosure from 4000 BC coming in. You'll see in a moment that we have quite a few of those coming up. And the amazing thing is, is that as I'll show you, new examples and new sites are coming up almost every day in the nature, in just normal commercial work. Cursus monuments also, think of them as long linear enclosures again it from the neolithic period but again often thought to be processional routes but these are enormous monuments henges henges are at the simplest just simply enclosed bank and ditched monuments usually with an internal bank uh, internal ditch sorry um good examples We've got, uh, you can see the photograph of Avebury at the, the top right, still got a town in it, for instance. Stonehenge, of course, is the famous example and is also the example where the bank and ditch are the wrong way around. And barrows. What you've got, the photograph, the large photograph I'm showing actually is not a million miles from Stonehenge. It's only three miles down the road at Long Barrow Crossroads. And it shows a fairly typical barrow group, incredibly dense. At the northern end, nearest the roundabout, that is a long barrow, that's a Neolithic long barrow. And then you've got numerous different types and examples of Bronze Age barrows coming from that. We also have Anglo-Saxon barrow, uh, barrows as well. 
the interesting fact is, is that I think someone was estimating in Britain, there's probably about 15,000 extant barrows. There is probably something in the region of about three or 4,000 barrows in Wiltshire alone. So they are very prolific. Now, this is just a, a quick snapshot of some of the uh, some of the monuments in the Stonehenge World Centre. Now, this is outside. Uh, well, I've done work in the area, but you can see the major curses. If I show that, these are the curses monuments, which run on for kilometres. There is Stonehenge with the processional route through to the River Avon. That is one of the henges at Durrington, and that is one of the causeway encampments at uh, Robin Hood's Ball. There. These are barrows, but not all the barrows are shown because otherwise that map just turns white. As I said, the point I wanted to make was that one of the pressures and one of the challenges that we have with the heritage system is, of course, that archaeology carries on beyond the boundaries. The World Heritage Site is protected under what well, it's scheduled national law tested by uh, international bodies, ICOMOS. But beyond it, it's the local authority who have to deal with it and commercial units that do the archaeology. Now, one of the university groups that's been doing work within the World Heritage Site is the Stonehenge Lin uh, Hidden Landscape Project, who have been using new technology and LIDAR to try and map as much of the Stonehenge World Heritage Site as possible. Now they've had some marvellous results. This is just a quick example of one of the LIDAR plots and even in the course, and this was three or four years ago, in one season they discovered over 16 new monuments within that landscape within the World Heritage Site. But again, you can see you're getting awfully close to the edge of the site and the archaeology continues. I'm going to give some examples of some things that have come up. These sites are outside the World Heritage Site, but they're covered under normal British planning law. But I'm going to mention this one because this has very recently come up. Some of you may have seen on the news that, that a major new Neolithic monument was found around Durrington Walls. And it's an absolutely enormous. This is over a, at least a mile in diameter, if not more, made up of a series of large pits. Now, a lot of the pits have been identified with the Hidden Landscape team with their geophysics. They haven't really had too much opportunity to investigate these in more detail, to dig them. But it is interesting in that they acknowledge when they published this, they did include a lot of data because two of the areas had actually been investigated as part of commercial projects. And in fact, if I just show you those two there, 14D, 15D, they're mine. That is one of those shafts that was found. They are potentially um, natural. They are potentially um, so what we call soak holes formed by glacial ice, but they are a focus of very intense middle and late Neolithic activity. You can see a little halo around the center of the shaft coming round. That is worked flint. That is thousands and thousands of pieces. That work was only done because of the British planning system. Otherwise, it would have been destroyed. And that is the value of the system. But the publication of this has fed into academia to those archaeologists dealing with it and the literature which means that they're able to take those results and build it into their own work and to date 
this is oh, the only major investigation of those initial pits. This gives you the first data about those pits to help inform. And that monument that been discovered has already had one big effect in that uh, there's certain discussions about some projects in the World Heritage Site. And because of the discovery of this monument, the decisions have been delayed by a month, uh, by four months to allow people to reconsider. The pressures on development in Wiltshire can be quite extreme. Housing is one of the biggest examples. One thing that's happening, as I mentioned, is over one ninth of the, the county is military. And gradually the regiments are moving back to Britain um, for rehoused from Germany. And there is a huge new housing estate being built for them at Lark Hill and has been for the last few years. It's unsurprising that when we thought we knew everything about Stonehenge and the monuments and how it tied together and the timelines, it is incredible that right at the edge of that, of the site that we stripped for the housing, a new causeway encampment was found. Just a clip of it, but with dating, it is actually earlier than a great deal of the monuments within the World Heritage Site. It is the earliest causeway encampment found in the Stonehenge landscape. Again, because of the strength of the commercial work. And it helps our understanding and development of that landscape, which is absolutely vital. Chris mentioned there is a lot of archaeological work within the World Heritage Site done by the universities. But again, it has to be very targeted. With commercial work, they've got the ability to get huge amounts of data, especially these new sites. So it is very quickly revolutionary, our understanding of the, of the Stonehenge landscape. Just down the road is more military housing at a place called Bolford. It's only about two, uh, two or three miles down. What you're looking at was completely unsuspected. It actually didn't, it's never shown up on aerial shots or anything, but uh, when the site was geophysically surveyed, that is a double hinge. That is the only double hinge known in Britain that's turned up. And again, uh, a very significant monument at the edge of the Stonehenge landscape. But interestingly, it is a monument that's been changed itself. Barrows were put around these monuments and it's also very common in this country where you've got Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments that later Anglo-Saxon communities are often buried nearby. And if you look very carefully on the uh, left hand side of that, you can see a load of little lines running down in between the tree throws. A lot of those um, dark shadows are tree, tree throws or where former trees are, but you can see a couple of lines. They're graves, over 150, and that is one of the earliest Anglo-Saxon cemeteries in this part of the world. The Anglo-Saxon um, movement basically ends at the bottom end of, of Wiltshire, um, and this is one of the furthest West Anglo-Saxon cemeteries. Uh, an incredible, enduring monument. Now, just giving you an indication of some of the archaeology that can turn up and the challenges is, is again, a site at Boscombe Down, also known as Amesbury Down, because I, I project manage this. The project took over 15 years to do. It was 100 hectares or football pitches, 100 football pitches of new housing. But very quickly during the course of that work, during the building of a school, an incredible burial was found, the Amesbury Archer, which is the richest beaker burial in Western Europe. And by that, I mean, um, early Bronze Age, dating to around about 2300 BC. 
to give you an example, the burial contained, just to do that so you've got the picture come up, the burial contained over 100 objects, which is already very, very significant. Most beaker burials only have a few, uh, a few finds with them. But he was found with some of the earliest, the earliest gold in Britain and also the earliest copper tools in Britain. Not only that, but that small black blob at his back is a mini anvil. He is a metal worker. And some of you may be aware, and some of you may not, but when isotope analysis was done, it was shown that he in fact actually came from the Alps. He came from continental Europe. He came to this country as a metal worker and was drawn by Stonehenge. But the whole landscape of that housing was full of Neolithic monuments and also a major Roman cemetery with only th with over 300 burials. But again, because of the strength of the system, it's been able to be recorded. It's been excavated. We could never have been, it could never have been scheduled or protected from that point of view. But interestingly enough, it has for over 20 years been able to draw in the local community with the local school, even the local school is called the Ainsbury Archer School, and has brought heritage extremely close to the local community. Another aspect of that I wanted to, to mention, because it's not prehistoric and it's not even what many people think of as archaeology. But when they were digging at Lark Hill, not only were they finding causeway encampments, they were finding some very recent stuff. And increasingly, this is part of what we do, is to reach out to local communities and other communities, because we can tell stories. And this is heritage, which is just as important. These training areas at Lark Hill was there in the First World War. A third of the troops that fought in France were trained at Lark Hill on their, on their way to battle. And they trained in real trenches which were built. Australian troops, British troops, Commonwealth troops, you name it. And it's interesting that a huge amount has survived that is not only of interest to the local community, but also to Australian groups who, you know, uh, have been welcoming this information and, and find it very enriching because we get the names and graffiti of people. Um, one example is the little stone that, that up the top there, that piece of chalk. If you look on the left hand side, three names down, there's a J Weathers. That's actually what the name is, John Weathers. And that's John Weathers below the photograph of him. He wrote that in 1916 while being trained at Lark Hill. We can actually trace his military career. We know that in um, six weeks before the end of the war, he won the VC. Uh, he captured over 120 German prisoners. We also know that two weeks later he was killed in an artillery bombardment, less than a month before the end of the war. But these are stories we can tell, and I'm glad to say that of the three, four uh, hundred names at least that we followed up so far, that some of the, uh, most of them survived and went on to live full lives. But they have a fascinating story to tell, and that is part of what we do. I wanted to mention this project as well, Barra Clump, because again, it's not part of a planning uh, or commercial project, but again, it's the way that heritage can make a difference. We're home to large military groups and regiments and things like that, and one of the regiments we're home to is the Rifles. The Rifles had a problem, um, sadly, with war is you send people to war, people get injured, um, both physically and mentally. And the rifles were trying to find ways that they could rehabilitate their soldiers, either to get them back into the army or on the way out, so they could start to get them ready for civilian life. And one of the ways that they did this was to get the soldiers involved with excavation and with archaeology, run by a guy called Richard Osgood, a fantastic scheme 
for veterans, which has really given them a real lease for life and got them back after, after some terrible, terrible experiences, as you can imagine. The interesting aspect of that project is not only did they deal with the soldiers, they dealt with their families as well, with the children, with the wives, even with the parents if necessary. It was getting everybody involved with heritage, teaching them new skills, not just archaeology, but filming, journalism, questioning, and using heritage as an example of being able to make a difference. And Wessex has been involved in giving uh, expertise and helping to monitor the digs and do the finds and reporting. But this is a kind of project where heritage can really make a difference. Another way it makes a difference, again, is we, we, as I said, we're blessed with huge amounts of archaeology. Um, when we were digging at Horton Quarry in Berkshire, we found um, one of these uh, Neolithic houses that came up. They're not, in this country, in, in Britain, they're relatively rare. I mean, there's probably 20, 30 examples known, um, decent examples. In Ireland, there are far many. There are a lot more. But it was uh, amazing that this turned up in the middle of an existing quarry that was partly being done and uh, was recorded to a great deal. We were contacted by Butzer Ancient Farm and I fully encourage you, you know, to go onto the internet and have a look at um, their website because they're a pres uh, they are a, a company or a firm who build replica buildings as accurately as possible for tourists and for educational groups so that people can go stay overnight if necessary and experience what it is to be in an ancient building they have roman villas they have iron age roundhouses but the one thing they wanted was a neolithic longhouse and so the digital information that was collected from that project has been used to start to build an accurate model and as close as possible to reality um, actually within Butzer. Sadly the, the, the COVID coming in has put a little bit of a, a halt to this because they had started building it. Um, they're, they're pretty close to finishing it now but um, there's going to be a big opening and everything that goes with it and I'm desperate to get out there and have a look because obviously there's been a lot of questions and academics are getting involved as well about how the stresses work, how the building works and different design options and this is a, a way of doing experimental archaeology but based on actual data and again this has come from a commercial project from the data from it is very important. Another thing that came up um, that increasingly is more worthwhile it came up funny enough when I gave a talk to a local group they had a small site, uh, an Iron Age site in Oxfordshire at Harwell. They had a very active local society. And it was interesting because although the site was a typical Iron Age site, and, and to be honest, there wasn't anything earth shattering about it. There was an object that was found, which was part of a, a comb, which actually is the earliest human representation found in the Iron Age. Um, and it's become quite famous. And what has happened is one of the members of the group asked, well, I showed them the comb and they said, well, could it be 3D printed? Because I want one. And funny enough, um, within a very short management time, we were able to print off examples and they're freely available for people. So again, 3D technology coming in is now going to give museums and everybody the chance to sell and own historical objects very quickly and very cheaply and I think that it'll always been great to go to a museum point at the find and go well that's brilliant I wish I could take that home with me well fairly soon you will be able to now one of the big changes with the planning coming in again was this sense of community um, very important with the planning system that the local community have their chance to have a say, but also that 
the heritage of it is not divorced. What a lot of what Chris was saying was very true that many of the people involved with archaeology in the past, middle class, white, male, um, you know, often for middle class, white males. But heritage is something they're trying to promote with our towns and our cities. Why where you live is important why it should be protected and what the value of it is and the new planning um, uh, policies that are coming in the framework emphasize that that local communities should have a chance through the through the planning and through archaeological and heritage work have the chance to understand where they live and the value of it now that's very easy to say but the example I've given here is, I don't want to go into huge depth with this, but um, even before COVID two years ago, many of you are very aware that Salisbury had a problem. Um, we got a lovely cathedral and apparently we had a little bit of a visitation from a, a couple of people um, who left a present. Uh, and unfortunately, it was devastating to the city. Salisbury does rely a large amount on tourism we have a huge footfall and markets and it meant that a large part of Salisbury was closed down. It meant businesses closed, it meant jobs were lost and even when things were cleaned up and everything went back to normal we still are suffering from the problem that many British towns and cities are having is how do you get your high streets going? How do you get a spirit going? Uh, and it's desperately needed in Salisbury and now even more than uh, before. But that had an initial impact. Just to give you an, an example, we were approached by the, uh, local, uh, the local trade council and we have become actively involved. They wanted heritage organizations as well as local businesses to be involved because they saw that we could give value and give the pride back to where we live because we are part of that community and it is our home and that was incredibly important. Some of the examples of things that have happened is that um, we're developing a new system with the uh, local businesses to be able to that people can use phone apps to bring up heritage information directly so that visitors can load something and even walking around can actually get the information on what they're looking at. That's not new. Museum of London, for instance, did a very good app and this is something based on it. But again, it's drawing on heritage information that's been collected and that we, we can give them. There are gonna be heritage trails in buildings and things like that using 3T building, uh, 3D models, but it is trying to get the shops to be attractive, to attract people, to get people back, but also a bit of a heritage aspect to it. Virtual reality, being able to produce models of Roman villas, but also some of the medieval buildings so you can walk through them. Again, they're going to be available throughout the town, again, to try and for things for visitors to see to give them the value of Salisbury and a very important point is again the the young people now Chris mentioned uh, a lot going on one of the huge things that's happened over the past 20 years of course is the young archaeologist club um, it is interesting that Wiltshire um, in a in my region in the Wessex region of five counties there are 15 groups of young archaeologists, each with about 30 to 40 young children under 12, who can learn about heritage and archaeology and practice it and engage with it. Um, 10 of those groups are in Wiltshire and uh, there's um, unofficial groups popping up everywhere because young people are really want to be engaged. Through school visits and young archaeologists, it's really trying to get them to appreciate the value of where they live and where they go. And I'm very pleased to say that one of the things that I've been involved with, um, and uh, Phil Harding from Time Team as well, is mentoring school children who uh, have an annual event 
where they present ideas about what they would like to see in Salisbury. Not all of these are heritage. Some of them are to do with transport and things like that and green environment. But it's good that not only businesses are involved with that, but the heritage organizations as well. So we get the hearts and minds. But at the bottom end of this, uh, the planning system in Britain makes this possible. The strength of it, but also we try to make sure that people appreciate it and the value of it because it's always under threat. People always want to make it simpler, but hopefully so far, everything has worked. But this is one of the great things that makes doing archeology span and heritage in this country that much easier to do. Okay. I think that is, from my point of view, uh, what I wanted to say. So, Chris, back to you. I think I'll just open it up for uh, Erica and, and uh, any questions we might have. I've, I've answered a few already in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to, you know, if people want to have a look at those or um, just feel free and ask any questions. I know we've, we've kind of gone on um, a bit longer than these webinars normally go, but we do have a double act and <laughs> people can, uh, um, can uh, stick with us for a few more minutes to ask or answer any questions. Yeah, and if anyone wants to ask a question um, using their microphone, just raise your hand and I can and turn it on for you. 